name is uh, David Bostwick. I'm a physician uh, and the founder of Bostwick Laboratories. This is a laboratory that focuses uh, entirely on urologic pathology. That is, we look at prostate biopsies, bladder, kidney, and testis, and that's all we do. The average pathologist in the United States and around the world will look at up to 24 major organs, breast, brain, skin, pancreas, of course, prostate. We focus, and we're differentiated in our focus entirely on those diseases that affect the urologic system with a special emphasis on prostate cancer because it is so common. And I've devoted the last 30 years of my life to study of prostate diseases and prostate cancer uh, from a pathologist's point of view. Ultimately, I'm the one with the microscope. I'm the one that tells your surgeon or your internist if you have cancer or not. And in my career to date, I estimate that I've probably diagnosed about 150,000 prostate cancers. The good news is that there are a lot more that are not cancer. Uh, but making that distinction is what I do and colleagues such as myself do for a living. In the past few years, what new tests have been developed that help you better advise the urologist and his patient about the diagnosis of prostate cancer? Today is certainly the most exciting time ever to be a pathologist, and it's a really good time to be a patient if you have to have a disease that requires you to be a patient. The reason for that is because of the advances that we've made to date and some of the advances that we are on the verge of bringing into clinical practice. Let's go over quickly some of the existing things that we use every single day. The Gleason grade, the Gleason score, which is the same thing, is used on biopsies, transurethral resections, radical prostatectomies. That's done looking through the microscope by a pathologist. We determine the pattern of the cancer. And if the pattern is well differentiated, it would be a Gleason score one or two. If it's moderately differentiated, it would be a Gleason pattern three. And if it's poorly differentiated, which means that it's the farthest removed from the normal pattern of the architecture of the prostatic tissue, that would be a four or five. In today's world, we don't use pattern one or two very often because those patterns are usually seen in cancers that arise in the transition zone. That's the area in the prostate around the urethra that is usually not biopsied in contemporary practice. In today's world, we usually are biopsying in the much more common area of the peripheral zone where most cancers arise. And those are the cancers that we worry about, the higher grades, Gleason 3, Gleason 4, Gleason 5, which would give uh, a score of 3 plus 3 is 6, 3 plus 4 equals 7. The Gleason grading system, as you know, we take the most common cancer that's present in the specimen, the biopsy, and then the second most common. Gleason grading has been with us for 40 years. It's one of the few things in medicine that has survived virtually intact for four decades because it is an extraordinarily powerful method of predicting how good or how well a patient will do uh, in terms of outcome. So you'd rather have a Gleason score six. In fact, those patients generally do very well and most of them, in fact, the majority are cured with, with most therapies today, whereas a Gleason score 9 or 10, those patients can also be cured, but there's a lower likelihood because the cancer is more aggressive. Then we get into other things such as stage, the extent of the cancer uh, within the prostate or outside of the prostate. And that's also something the pathologist does, and that's also been around a long time. Uh, and the way we do staging. Sometimes the definitions change, but from a pathologist's point of view, we look at the cancer, we determine the Gleason score, and then we determine is it inside the prostate? If it's outside of the prostate, into the periprostatic tissue, we determine where, how much, and what the grade of the cancer is outside. Is it in blood vessels? You don't want that. Is it in lymph nodes? Is it in the lymphatic channels? Or is it, even if it's in the bone? And those are all the components that we use and put together to create the staging system that is another very strong predictor of outcome. So ultimately, what I do as a pathologist is I not only diagnose the presence or absence of cancer, but I also, and my colleagues, predict what the, the cancer is going to do. Is it going to be a cancer, a, a, a pussycat that is not going to be aggressive or is it going to be a tiger that's going to roar and perhaps uh, move more, more rapidly uh, if not treated? We give that information then to the clinician. We do not treat cancer 
although we interact very closely. And I think the greatest power of a pathologist uh, beyond knowing what he or she does or does not know under the microscope is to be able to interact effectively with their client, their colleagues uh, in urology or other branches of medicine. There are a couple of new things that people are asking questions about. One is the PCA3 test, and the other is the idea of a tertiary Gleason pattern in tissue from some prostate cancer patients. So the tertiary Gleason pattern has actually been around for quite a number of years. The concept uh, is that the primary Gleason score and the secondary Gleason score, a uh, grade that we give to create the score, 3 plus 4 equals 7, may be useful, but what if we have a large tumor and there's a little bit of 5 present? So we have 3 as a primary, 4 as a secondary, but there's a little bit more of a pattern 5. And the reality is that we should report the amount of pattern 5 because the amount of high-grade cancer may be as important as the Gleason score. So we use the Gleason grading system, and this is an extension, if you will, of the, the system. It only applies in about two or three percent of patients, but if I had a little bit of really high stuff, I would want to know it as well. So that's what the tertiary score is uh, that we give, and usually it's not there. If you get a report and there's no mention of it, that means it's not there because it is the standard of care for every pathologist around the world to report a tertiary Gleason grade if it's present. Now you also asked about other uh, tests and there are a number of them. We've had serum prostate specific antigen or PSA since 1987 in the United States and it's a very powerful test. The problem with PSA is that it is a very sensitive test. So if it's elevated, it's likely that you have something wrong with your prostate but the specificity for prostate cancer is very low. So your PSA is more likely to be elevated if your prostate is simply enlarged, which the majority of men have. Uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH, occurs in virtually all men. And under the microscope, I see it in virtually every man over the age of 40. So microscopically, everybody once got it. Most men recognize this when they get into their 50s or 60s. Suddenly, they notice that they're starting to get up once in the middle of the night, maybe twice or three times. And that's usually because their prostate is getting larger, and it means that they have to empty their bladder uh, earlier than they did before because the prostate is now pushing on the bladder. That's it's a very simple mechanical process, at least from my point of view it is. And under the microscope, it's easily diagnosed. We need something better than PSA. PSA is arguably one of the most important biomarkers that exists in all of medicine today, particularly in the cancer field. But it's not enough. It's not good enough because most men with an elevated PSA do not have prostate cancer. And a lot of them are worrying needlessly because of this elevation. Uh, as a consequence, there are many people that are looking for new markers. And we, as a diagnostic laboratory that makes our services available to the urologists throughout the United States and the United Kingdom, are also on the lookout for the next best test. It has to be validated. It's got to be real. There's got to be a lot of data to support it. But when it's ready, even if it's not Food and Drug Administration approved, we're allowed legally to introduce tests, at least in a limited nature. Uh, but we have to believe in it. And we have to validate it in our laboratory. We can bring that forward. PCA3, standing for Prostate Cancer Antigen, or PCA3, refers to a gene, a genetic test for a marker that is present uh, in men who have prostate cancer more likely than in men who do not. So a positive PCA3 indicates a higher likelihood of prostate cancer. This was discovered uh, at uh, a number of institutions in the late 1990s, early 2000. So it's only been around for less than 15 years right now, but it's a very exciting test available for many laboratories. We're only one of many that offer this test, and we do it the same way everyone else does. We may have a different name for it, but ultimately the test is effectively the same. And it, the advantage of this test is that it gives the specificity. What that means is that if the test is positive, you probably have prostate cancer. The sensitivity of PSA says that if it's elevated, you probably have something wrong in the prostate and it might be prostate cancer. So this helps us to say with PSA, you've got something wrong in the prostate and then PCA3 says it's probably prostate cancer, but you still need a biopsy. 
you still need, because at the present time and probably well into the near future, the biopsy, having tissue under the microscope, will remain the gold standard for prostate cancer diagnosis, uh, simply because we don't have anything that's as good as, as that at the present time. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about that you see as holding potential for the future? One of the things that we've needed for my entire career has been imaging of the prostate, a male mammogram, if you will. Uh, we don't have that yet. I'm hopeful that we will, perhaps in my lifetime, perhaps not. We've been waiting a long time for it, but there's some really interesting concepts that are coming forward now, new technologies, new approaches. And I am hopeful that in the next five years, we will have imaging that will help greatly in identifying the location, the presence, location, and extent of prostate cancer. That would revolutionize the field, and we need that but we don't have it today. We have promises of it, but we don't have it today. There are other markers that are coming out. There's a, a, a small laboratory that has identified uh, multiple genetic markers for prostate cancer, which in combination increase the likelihood from blood that you have prostate cancer. Another group from urine increases the likelihood you have prostate cancer. We are exploring all of these tests, and it is our commitment to have those tests available if at all possible uh, in the near future. One of them is gene fusions, uh, a translocation of genetic material from one chromosome to the other. A very interesting and potentially uh, exciting new area that's, that's come out in, in this domain. Uh, there's also some tests of mitochondria, an intracellular uh, organelle that may have some genetic abnormalities that would also predict the likelihood of something in the prostate. We look at it from two points of view the presence of cancer, and then when you have cancer, how well it's going to do, prognosis or prediction of outcome. And both of those areas are very fruitful areas of investigation. You know, I, I've, I've lived through, as we all have, through the, uh, the uh, evolution of uh, understanding of the human genome. We've now mapped the human genome. And I look at that, creating the, the, the map, or if, if you prefer, the blueprint uh, of the genome as very important. But that does not give us, ultimately, actionable information for changing people's lives. What it does is it now gives us the bedrock upon which to build the testing that will allow us to do that. And that's why I'm so excited, because we now know the targets to go after. We now know what to do. And the techniques that are available in the laboratory are truly profound and amazing and, uh, uh, and, and sometimes hard to interpret or understand because they're so amazing. But it's happening. It's, an, it's the most exciting time ever to be in this field. And I'm very optimistic that our ability to diagnose prostate cancer, bladder cancer, all the cancers of the urologic field, and to predict outcomes will continue to improve probably quite rapidly, which will make my life easier. And most of all, it will help all of the patients that we're committed to, uh, to serving.